So two weeks ago, we were here doing a lecture, and we said it was going to be the last in our series. Um, and we did uh, Karasek and Yasmetinov and um, Sultan Khan. And, you know, we do these lectures typically once a month. But actually that night um, of our lecture, the, during that night, the chess world, or the, at least the American chess community, lost a pillar in Walter Brown. And Warren emailed me the next day, said, I don't know if you've heard, but, um, you know, Walter Brown has, has passed away, and, you know, we should do something. And I, I agreed. So that's why we're doing this uh, exceptional topic tonight where we cover, uh, instead of calling it a life, the life and chess of Walter Brown, we're simply going to call it a tribute to Walter Brown. And you'll find out, you know, who he was and what he represented to the chess community. And he was a pretty interesting character in a, in a number of different dimensions. So he's certainly worthy of discussing. There have also been a lot of people on the internet, on YouTube in particular, who said, oh, you should cover more American players. So maybe we'll make them happy at the same time. So if it's your first time, again, um, I'm Lucas Anderson. I'm a librarian, so I have the summer off and, and love it. And so it was not at all inconvenient to prepare a, an extra lecture for the month of July. And uh, Warren, unfortunately, does not have the month of July off, so he's had to you know, squeeze in prep for tonight's lecture um, as an addition, so we certainly appreciate that. So I'll be doing the biography, and he'll handle the chess analysis. And tonight we're going to present to you five games. Normally we do three, um, and it's kind of half and half between biography and chess. Tonight it's going to be slanted more toward chess, and less toward biography, but you'll still get a good feel for um, who Mr. Brown was and uh, how he rose to prominence in the chess community. So Walter Sean Brown, nicknamed six time because he won the uh, US championship six times, and also nicknamed King of the Swiss because he had an uncanny ability to win pretty much any Swiss tournament and any major Swiss tournament that existed in the U.S. in the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, chances are he won it. He was very, very good at uh, figuring out how to win Swiss tournaments, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. So he was born January 10th, 1949 in Australia, and died two weeks ago uh, at the, uh, he had played a simul and taught some classes and then gone to uh, the house of uh, a very close friend and stayed the night there and passed in his sleep. So. Walter Brown was born to, um, his father was named Walter Francis Brown, and he was, according to uh, the son, a fifth generation Irish American who had fought as a captain in the army on D-Day in World War II. He was in charge of an artillery regiment. His mother was named Hilda Brown, and she was Australian by birth, but she was also of Irish descent. In fact, her great grandfather was Sir Charles Russell, who was a Lord Chief Justice of England from 1896 to 1900, and also um, a member of the nobility uh, from Ireland. Walter was the oldest of four children. He survived by a, a sister and two brothers. Walter calls himself 90% Irish. So you, as we're going through this, think of the different heritages that are present in Walter. And, uh, but think about it through the lens of uh, someone who considered himself strongly Irish. Okay, I'm also gonna be talking quite a bit about Bobby Fischer tonight. And the reason is kind of uncanny. So Walter Brown was born in Sydney, Australia in um, 1949. At the age of three, his American father and Australian mother decide to move to uh, New York together. So they moved to Forest Hills, New York um, when Walter's three. At the age of seven, they moved to Belmore and Long Island, which uh, the arrow is kind of pointing in that general direction now. And then when Walter was 10, he moved to Brooklyn. Now, Walter is not very happy with that move for a number of reasons. For one, Belmore was closer, it was, it was more suburban, if you will, there were more activities to engage in, notably sports, and Walter's always been uh, passionate about sports, so he played baseball and tennis and all sorts of other things. He and his father would often go fishing uh, because, as you can tell, it's very, very close to the water. And this is where Walter, Walter credits fishing, actually, for helping him develop patience. 
which obviously comes in handy in chess. But at age 10, they moved to Brooklyn. And the reason they moved to Brooklyn, uh, I've heard Walter say in an interview in, I think, 2003, that he didn't know why they moved. But then in his 2012 book, he says that the reason that they moved was probably because his father was a vice president of a commodities company. And um, to be closer to work, which I guess would have been Wall Street or thereabouts, they moved to Brooklyn. And you can imagine that that was a big change. It was going from a more suburban lifestyle to a very metropolitan lifestyle. Walter was not able to keep up with things like sports. He did not really like Brooklyn very much. And instead of spending his time on sports, he spent his time on chess. So his father taught him to play chess around age seven. Age 10 is when he really starts getting involved with study. So he's taking the train a lot to and from school, and what is he doing on the train? He's studying chess. He is staying up late at night studying chess. He's spending many, many waking hours studying chess. He thought that from the age of about 10 to 14, there wasn't anybody in the world who studied chess more than him until he learned about what Fisher did. And then he thought, well, maybe Fisher studied chess more than he did. But he was certainly very devoted to chess, and he improved very rapidly. So when I say Fisher's footsteps, it's not just the fact that he grew up in Brooklyn. It's that he spent his time studying in the Brooklyn Public Library. It's that at age 11 or age 10, he starts playing at the Brooklyn Chess Club, where Fisher got his start uh, with Carmen Negro. Now, an interesting distinction to point out is that Bobby Fisher benefited from the tutelage of Carmine Negro and Jack Collins and a couple of other prominent, almost proxy fathers. I didn't find any record of that in Walter Brown. He seems to have developed his, he seems to have had a supportive family, but he seems to have developed pretty much on his own through self-study, which is admirable. At age 13, Brown starts attending the Manhattan Chess Club which at this time in the United States is the most prominent chess club in the country and one of the most prominent in the world. And he's rubbing elbows with Sammy Ryshevsky and later meets Bobby Fischer and many other really strong players who play at the Manhattan Chess Club. At age 13, he starts attending Erasmus High School. You may remember that that's where Fischer went to high school. In the Fischer lecture, I, I mistakenly identified Erasmus is a private school. It was originally, but at the time Fisher went, it was a public school, and that's also true for Brown. It was a public school. Brown, incidentally, was six years younger than Bobby Fisher. So he's gone to this, the same uh, public library to study chess, and he really liked going there because they had nice wooden sets. He has gone to the same chess clubs as Bobby Fisher, and he's got a work ethic that's similar to Bobby Fisher. There are some distinctions, obviously. One is that Brown started a little later than Fisher. Fisher started at age five or six. Brown started uh, earnestly trying around age 10. He, there's, uh, there's both died very early, right? I'm sorry? Oh, they both died very early, 66. Uh, 64 for Fisher and 66 for Brown. Yeah. yeah. Well, Fisher's death was renal failure because he refused kidney dialysis. Brown, I've not heard. I, I've not heard what uh, the cause was. Um, he passed in his sleep, perhaps some sort of heart failure. I'm, I'm not sure. So also an interesting uh, parallel that they have. Do you remember when I told you that Fisher's parents, or his mom, because the dad wasn't present in the picture, that Fisher's mom was worried about Bobby's obsession with chess and had asked him to see a psychiatrist. And he saw a psychiatrist and was evaluated and saw another one was evaluated. They both thought that chess was good for him. And then the mom um, put him in touch with Dr. Ruben Fine and instead of really talking about chess, they, or instead of talking about Bobby's you know, personality or conflicts or this, that, or the other, they basically played a bunch of chess. Well, at age 14, Brown's parents were concerned by his obsession with chess, and they sent him to a psychiatrist. And he went to something like four or six sessions and found out that they spent about 15 minutes talking and about 45 minutes playing chess. And so the parents kind of ended that and said, well, instead of for us 
paying for therapy, we should have been charging for chess lessons. <laughs> so um, Brown, like Fisher, also gets evaluated because he has this kind of obsession. Another parallel at age 15, thereabouts, Brown drops out of high school. Fisher, you recall, did the same. He dropped out, said that you know public education or education didn't hold anything important for him, that he was going to be a professional chess player. And he was a grandmaster at age 15, so I can understand. Brown was not a grandmaster at age 15. He was older when he achieved that distinction, which we'll get into. But he has spent so many evenings not only playing chess, but also poker, backgammon, and another couple, a couple of other games that we'll get into. And he's been gambling on these games. You know, his parents will give him spending money for food or subway fare or whatever, and he'll use that as stakes and play blitz and, and win that more. And he's actually kind of making a living playing chess, and he's getting invited. He's, taking, he's picked up poker very, very quickly, and he started getting invited to games with higher and higher stakes. And by the time he's 15, he's basically playing the best chess players in the city and the best poker players in the city and handling himself very well. Now, this is important because it tells us that Brown's love for gambling and his love for poker and chess and all these other competitive mind games, if you will, starts very early. And it also tells us that he was given quite a bit of autonomy. Now, some of these places that he played were quite seedy. You know, he'd play in clubs and bars where, you know, fights could break out over the result of a game. Um, he doesn't go into whether or not he was involved in any, but it would be naive to think that it never happened. Perhaps his age protected him. But also, you recall Fisher, his mom or his sister always came and picked him up from the Manhattan Chess Club and escorted him home. I don't find any record of that with Walter Brown. He seems to, his parents seem to have said, well, you know, go out there and uh, just be home by a certain time. And maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But it didn't seem like there was any real, he doesn't get into his, in his book at, in any case about any friction there. And they, I don't know if they supported, but they accepted his decision to drop out of school and to pursue chess and poker professionally. So interesting ways that his journey parallels Fisher and interesting ways that it diverges from Fisher. And the only known picture of Brown and Fisher together is them playing Blitz. They did talk to one another. Uh, obviously, Fisher considered himself the better player because he considered himself better than everybody. But they, he did ask Brown's opinions from time to time. And Brown had thought about offering his services as a second to Fisher in tournaments, but never did, and, and regretted, in fact, that he didn't offer his services as a second for the 1975 championship, which never came to pass. But before we get too far ahead, let's get a feel for uh, Brown's style and look at his one and only game that was played against Fisher in a tournament setting. This is in Zagreb 1970, when um, they both happened to be in the same tournament. You can imagine that Brown wasn't in the same chess circles as uh, Fisher until the end, I, I guess you could say, of Fisher's career. So it took a while for Brown to kind of work his way up to be on that level. But the one and only game that they played in tournament conditions was Zagreb, and Warren's going to go over that for you, so I will delegate that to him. Yeah, this game is uh, pretty cool. You really get a sense for how strong Walter was. Uh, I mean, putting putting Fisher in, his, um, in, the, in the difficulties that he encountered, It was actually a rare game where uh, Fisher, you know, varied from a night orf and and played allegations with him to actually. I mean, the only other game I can think of where he did this was against Spassky actually. Uh, so it was definitely a an offbeat opening for for Fisher. Uh, and actually, before I get too far into the opening, I just want to show something. So Walter played knight f three, which is perfectly fine. Now, uh, I'll show you an interesting. Uh, interesting line which is related and you'll see why later. So another common line for white here is like c4 for example, knight back, he takes. So this is a, a common way for white to play and here actually Karpov uh, came up with this interesting move, uh, rook c1. And after castles played b3. Uh, 
Now white's setup may look a little bit strange, but white's idea is to play rook c1 to protect the knight, b3 to protect c4. So now the bishop on f1 can be free. And the difficulty black has in this position is the development of the decisive bishop. He doesn't really have a good home. I mean, basically, in these kind of positions, black would be very, very happy to trade it off for the white knight on g1. And if white were to play like knight f3, black would, would happily exchange it for the knight. So black's difficulty in this position lies in uh, the awkwardness of a light squared bishop. And if you play a move like knight c6, white will play d5 and say bishop b2. And, and white has a pretty good position. Now, uh, white white's playing against this light squared bishop here. And so Walter's opening is maybe not quite so energetic anymore. That's why he gets into troubles later. Um, so he played knight f3, which is fine, by the way. But after g6 is already kind of a critical moment, um, I, I think white here basically has to play uh, bishop c4 to hope for any advantage. There's a famous game between uh, Gasparov and Sam Flatten, actually. Uh, he's actually, he was my coach in high school. Uh, and yeah, and uh, yeah, Platnik has been the coach of the U.S. teams and World Youth and such, and uh, he, uh, but this was not one of Platnik's finest games. <laughs> Kasparov crushed him with this Bishop C4 game. It's, you know, you, you'll see it in Zillion's ebooks, and Kasparov includes it in, you know, some of his best games. Uh, so that's worth looking at if you're interested. Uh, but Walter in, in the game chose Bishop B2. Uh, we'll, we'll forgive Walter because this opening hadn't really been developed so much yet. For bishop b2. The, no, this game? I don't, I don't actually don't know what the time control was. Do you know what it was? I think it was, it was uh, 40 minutes and two and a half hours, and then mm -hmm. another one was half an hour. Yeah, there, there were several Germans, I guess. Uh, yeah, this, this was like an eight or nine hour game. Uh, I've journeyed over like three or four times in the past couple of years. Yeah, I don't remember at what point the game was adjourned, but uh, we'll worry about that too much. So when you, one thing you'll notice in this game, as opposed to that last line I showed you, is that here, black is able to solve the problem of a bishop with ease, right? It has no problem getting it out and basically exchanging it for the white knight. Um, and it causes white some tactical issues because immediately uh, black actually has kind of a threat here. If it was black to play, what would you guys do? Yeah, black is essentially threatening a take on f3, and then, say, if bishop takes, then the c4 pawn retains. And you don't want to play g takes f3 in even function. So white is basically forced to play b3 to protect that. So now d5. Uh, this is thematic in this position in order for black to basically blockade this pawn on g4 from the beginning. So now c5. Knight c8. Now knight c8 is also another thematic move for this line. Um, here, tactically, it can't go to d7. But even if the knight could, like as a pawn on e6, he wouldn't want to put it there. Uh, where, do, where do you think Fisher is going with this knight? Exactly. He's gonna. Black would like to put it on f5 to put pressure on d4, and he's gonna get there by playing e6 and knight e7. So that's just thematic for these uh, Al Yakin positions where the e pawn exchanges. Uh, the black knight on b6 almost tries, almost always tries to head for f5. So h3, um, uh, Walter does point out that white does white does have a, a, a stronger move here. Uh, b4 is probably slightly better. But e even in this position, black's kind of solved some problems. Uh, the problem white has is that d4 is weak. I mean, in this position, black is play e6. Now, b5 is positionally a little bit risky for white because black can play knight a5 and then head for c4. So even though white has a lot of space on the queen side, it's, it's not a perfect position by any chance. So anyway, so he played h3, and basically black just has a clear advantage here. Although white has a few bishops, black has no weaknesses, and that target on g4 is really hard for white to defend from. Queen b2. White has to guard against ideas like queen f6, knight e7, f5, so you gotta be able to get a rook to the g file.
So although white's gotten rid of one of the pesky knights uh, and black has double pawns, the black rook is open and white's still left with a kind of useful house for a bishop here. See, and, and here, actually, I think Fisher kind of goes astray. Uh, F5 is a, is a very challenging move for white to meet, but black actually has a pretty cool idea. Uh, Stockfish points out that queen h4 is pretty strong. The idea is you attack b4, and now if you say play f4, queen f6, right? Only way to defend b4 is with rook e1, and, and now Stockfish points out rook a8 puts white in a, in a tough spot. The problem for white is that if you play a move like bishop b3, uh, black can win material. Exactly, yeah. Black can actually just take his pawn and just wins the pawn. And if you trade, then after all of this, the white rook on a1 is unprotected, so black can just take the bishop. And Stockfish is pretty optimistic about Black's chances here, and, and why not? I mean, White's passively placed, and Black won a pawn. So uh, this would have been pretty strong for, for Black. Uh, and I, there's really not much alternative for White, because guarding b4 is, is pretty difficult otherwise. But he played f5. Uh, th this is challenging for White in some different reasons, too. So bishop b3, queen f6. And here's kind of another uh, turning point in a way, actually. So uh, Fisher Fisher played the rook back, but uh, he does have a much simpler move here. Uh, well, if you take on d4 right away, then uh, white will take the rook. Uh, knight takes d4, uh, don't queen g2. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, queen takes d4. I think white will take and then take the rook. Uh, what was he looking at here? Oh, here? Yeah. Um. Any other suggestions? Yeah, uh, Brown points out rook takes b3 is actually pretty uh, pretty interesting. The idea is, you know, you're gonna you're gonna win a pawn and then get a strong knight, and white's gonna be left with some weak pawns. So, for example, if you take, just like knight takes b4, and actually black is gonna get a pretty strong kingside attack. What you do is play f3 next and such. So, and and white's rooks don't exactly have a lot of targets, so it's gonna be tricky to start counterplay. Yeah, it, it is unnatural in certain ways. Uh, uh, bishop b2. Could they have the knight on c3? Yeah, could move the knight. I'm wondering if it's even. Uh, it would have been knight e2 before. <coughs> yeah, knight e2. Well, if, if knight e2. Then queen takes, and then the bishop is protected. Mm, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I don't think this would be that great for black. But I, I think maybe f3 is. F3 looks pretty interesting. And the, the threat is just knight e2, right? Um, maybe white can trade, but I don't know if... Uh, hmm. I mean, it looks risky for white to even do this. I don't think this works, but you could try something like this, maybe.
Yeah. And maybe rook f7. Maybe take pawn and like bishop c3. That's all they take. It's it's probably somewhat equal. But as you'll see in the game, actually, Fisher gets in some interesting problems. Okay. So rook back, bishop d2. Uh, keep in mind b5 is hanging, so knight takes b4 is not that great. f3. Um, yeah, this move is fine. Here, here is where uh, Fisher really starts to go wrong. So, uh, the problem with Black's position here is actually b6, right? White's threatening to play a3, and then the knight has no squares to go back, and then white will move to this. So, Black really uh, only has one decent move here. Well, rook e8 runs into uh, a3, and then takes on b5, and there's a pin. Takes a2. I'm just looking at it. I think, actually, rook takes b6. He takes and takes, followed by taking the knight, and then taking the rook. Oh, rook takes a2. I think takes and then I think on e6. So you guys are noticing a trend, right? Just white pretty much chomping on e6 almost every time, right? So rook e8 didn't work to defend the e pawn because there's a pin on the e pawn. King f7. King f7, yeah. Yeah, that would have been black's best shot here. So there's no pin on the e file, so there's no bishop takes b5 trick. And now e6 e6 is just bent over king. So yeah, this this probably would have been perfectly fine for Black. Black shouldn't have too many problems here. White doesn't really have much activity to speak of unless he just went over to adding onto that bishop. But he played f4 instead. It's just too ambitious. The problem is he loses these two pawns here, and getting the past f pawn doesn't do much for him. So push, and now rook two. And now Black is having some serious problems because these two bishops, which have been terrible the whole game, are coming to life now. White has these dynamic pawns and two bishops. This is a very difficult endgame for Fisher. And this is so often the case that reaching the time control to move forward is often a scramble. And this game is no exception. And, and like moves 35 to 40 were played with both players in time pressure. So it's very common for Walt Brown, you know, from move 30 onward to be scrambling to reach the time control or move forward with the game. Yeah, I noticed just uh, from looking briefly at his annotations that he, he mentioned several times about spending 45 minutes on a single move. So, yeah, time trouble looks like it was a, a pretty common occurrence for him. Here, rook a1, exchanging a pair of rooks makes it easier because this rook has been a pain the whole game. There's no more tricks on d4 without that rook. He decides to take, actually. Uh, the problem with taking on a1 and trading rooks is that white will be left with this d pawn, and that's going to cost black. So that's why he puts on d4 to get rid of that pesky pawn. But unfortunately, he's down in exchange in the end game, and it's still not easy. I will point out, uh, you know, it, it might not always be useful, but the good thing for black here is that uh, white's remaining bishop, white has that remaining bishop and an h pawn. So if it ever gets to an endgame where black is down a piece and white has bishop and pawn against the king, it's, it's going to be a draw. 
So that's something that you that's worth noting at least in some cases. So slowly but surely, white is activating the king and black pieces are left in a pretty passive position. You'll notice the patience here with Walter maneuvering his rook back. Yeah, this, this is definitely a, an instructive endgame in that uh, if you're white here and, and you're playing a tournament game, you shouldn't be spending lots of time on every move. You should just be trying to put pressure on the b-pawn, you know, like we've done with the rook. But you don't have to be productive, be productive with your moves because you can pretty much maneuver forever. So this is definitely one of those games where if, if you're white, you should be moving pretty quickly. I mean, Fisher is the one that has to be thinking every move, okay, am I losing tactically? <laughs> am I going to lose the b-pawn or lose the knight? So white's finally traded the b-pawn for the h-pawn, and this is good because you have to get a passed pawn to win this game. You're going to have to win one of these black pieces. So white's now traded a pair of rooks. Slowly but surely making a little bit of progress here. Yeah. Now keep in mind, both of these players hated draw. <laughs> Walter talks specifically about, we know Fisher, we know you know how lopsided his score is in terms of draw percentage, but both players were like that, so neither of them were thinking draw. Well, Fisher was, but Brown was not. Yeah, Wal Walter in this position, I guarantee you his thought press wasn't his thought process wasn't, oh, I'm drawing with Fisher, yay! <laughs> <laughs> this guy didn't really care who his opponent was. And here, actually, he missed uh, kind of an opportunity to make his life a lot easier. Uh, in the game, he pushed the pawn, and he does point out that it does technically win, but only by a series of, like, only, only moves. Uh, it would have been better to play rook h7, actually. Uh, the problem black has now is that you can't move the king, because of c7, and you'll either lose a knight if you take the pawn, or if you slide back over, then you're going to get mated and pretty much already going to drop the piece. Mm -hmm. So he would have had to play a move like knight. Uh, like, pretty much. Well, not one move. After knight d3, white wins by playing the bishop here. Say king here, white check. And this is pretty much an easy win for White now. You'll play c7 next move and win the piece. But this wasn't exactly easy to see. Yeah, instead, he pushed. He thought he saw something, but he missed Fisher's defense here. So knight back. Knight to six. Now, why, why didn't he fork and take the rook? I mean, since he looked, yeah. Yeah, he didn't fork and take the rook because white promotes the check and queen in that. So, queen. So, 95. And here, what's, what's the saving move for, for Fisher? This is the move he missed here. No. Oh, this is the move that Brown missed, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if knight takes f7, then bishop d7 and the queen is raised. And if you take the pawn, then white's up a piece.
check with what? It's black to play. Uh, knight e7. I think white can take and then check and then poke. Well, knight d7 is check. That's why white has to take it. Okay, knight c4, I think. King b5. Um, that. King c6, obviously. Oh, maybe it's uh, king a6. Well, I'm just not sure about King B5. Well, I have something here. Oh, you mean in this position? Right. Okay, nice C4. Seven, I'm guessing. Oh, that, that doesn't work. Though. Okay, so we're taking it. Ah, uh, maybe it's Bishop B five. If you play back, then check, check. Ah, uh, okay, this is Bishop. Yeah, check. That's checkmate, actually. Play King over, then taking Bishop. Oh. What? Not quite. <laughs> I guess king it. Okay, a7 is the wrong square for the king. a6. <laughs> okay. And now this, this looks sufficient, right? Because if uh, 95, oh, whoops, 95 doesn't have to take. And then let's go back here. Yeah, king king gate doesn't work because it's check. And now king gate we have this. And that that really wins the bishop here. Okay. So it looks like knight c4, king a6. So yeah, black only has one move here. What's that? Oh, bishop c7, rook c7. <laughs> yeah, I think you are crazy, yeah. Uh, I think actually just take it. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> this lures the white king away from the pawn is the problem. So after takes, take the rook. And black is just in time to guard b7 with that knight. Wow. Just in time. And unfortunately, he can't make progress. He tried a few moves, but uh, there's no way for him to prom promote the pawn. And here they finally breached as well. But yeah, really cool game. I mean, uh, I I'm really, I'm really amazed at Fisher's tenacity that game. I mean, like, it's it's really hard to play that in game for so many moves and not mess up. It's uh, it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was mad. Yeah. <laughs> I think if Fisher didn't win, he was probably upset. <laughs> and not only that, if, if he if he won and made a mistake, he would probably still be upset. <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of the obsessive personality he has. I mean, there there was even a battle. You know, he he uh, he won an endgame against Botvinnik, and you know they they kept going back and forth. He and the, the Russians on analyses. You know, Botvinnik hand would come back and say, "Oh, I had a draw here by this," and Fisher would come back and say, "No, I still win." <laughs> So I think with Fisher's obsessive personality, he was probably, even though he played nicely, he was probably still upset. Any questions about this game? Oh, I, sh I should have just clicked differently, huh? Why did White <laughs> Well, at the, at the tournament, Bobby Fisher is up several points already. 
So he was cruising in first class. But it wasn't enough for Fisher to win his ring. He had to win at least an event all the time. And he had won the U.S. championship in 67, I think, 11-0. Three times from dust. That was his perfect, you know, perfect run. It's not like Fisher wouldn't go into the last round and say, oh, well, if I draw, you know, um, I still am outright first and I still get all the money in, so why not just draw? No. That's not how Fisher thought. That's not how Brown thought either. He wanted to win every single game. And you always have that scholar on your hand? Which picture you showed? Brown? Yeah. Yeah, I, I found one <laughs> picture of him smiling. I have dozens. Yeah, he's a very happy guy. Yeah, well, I'm serious. He's like this. He's really good. I think that's true for most of these guys. Most yeah. everyone we've covered has been super competitive. All right, so that was played in 1970. Fisher obviously would go on to win the world championship uh, in this match with uh, Spassky in 72 and 73. But, uh, and, Brown, and, and Fisher, you'll recall, kind of dropped off the tournament scene after about 1968, 1969. Participated in the candidate cycle, one or two other tournaments, but that's about it. Um, and it took many people to intervene to convince Fisher to even play in the championship in 72. And one of the people that intervened was was actually Walter Brown's mother. Uh, Fisher had called Walter Brown's house to ask you know his opinion on something, and Walter says that his mom gave Bobby a pep talk. So, um, so they knew each other. They had played that one game. They'd done some analysis together. They played quite a bit of blitz. Although Fisher was kind of in a in a different league, you know, for the majority of of their careers. Brown obviously got a draw there and a well-fought draw, but that was the only time they would meet across the board in an official tournament. Now, when Brown turned 18, he moved to California, moved from Brooklyn to Santa Monica, California, and he went there for a couple of reasons. He says in his book that he wasn't getting enough action, and what he means by that is he wasn't getting enough chess games for stakes, because people wouldn't bet against him, and poker for stakes because he was getting really, really good. Um, same thing for games like backgammon. He would play backgammon and win at that too. So he went to California for the action, he says, but we also should remember that the late 60s was an interesting time to be in California, in Southern California in particular. You know, you had student protests and kind of the hippie movement and, and all of that really started in, in the United States anyway. It started in, in California. And Walter Brown was there for a lot of it. And it, it seems that while he was there, he kind of did the California thing. You know, he bought a motorcycle. He may have dabbled in some psychedelics. And, and he um, played a lot of uh, chess and a lot of poker and a lot of this, that, and the other. He also used this time to travel extensively. For him, playing chess and playing poker and winning money was more, I mean, obviously he loved doing it, but it, he loved competing, but it's kind of a means to an end. There are stories of, you know, uh, Sierra Juan is talking about how they played in a Lone Pine tournament together in California and um, Brown offered to drive him home and they had to stop at Reno on the way so that Brown could play some blackjack to make some money for gas. And, and so this is a common theme with Brown that he would earn money, you know, and then he would travel and spend it and then he'd need to figure out a way to earn some more money. So it was kind of a the lifestyle is important, too. So in January through August of 1968, he traveled to Europe. Ostensibly, it was to watch a friend named Bernard Zuckerman play in some tournaments. His, his friend Bernard Zuckerman was an IM. Walter Brown at this time is not an IM. So he is not getting invitations to compete in these same tournaments. He'd like to. But he's not getting invitations because he doesn't have the title. And he can't really get the title because there aren't enough tournaments in the United States where he can qualify for the IM or GM norm. And he thought maybe he'd get some action in Europe. It didn't really happen, but he traveled a lot, Spain, France, Italy. He spent quite a bit of his time in Copenhagen and Denmark. He was able to br you know, brush elbows with some of the chess greats and play some offhand blitz games like against 
Tal and Korchnoi, and he said he got crushed. You know, he's 18 years old at this time. He's not yet uh, a GM. And these guys are, are very much in their prime. So because he's not getting much action in terms of potential tournaments for IM norms, he goes to Australia. Now his mother is Australian. He has dual citizenship. So he plays in the Australian Championship. And he scores 13.5 out of 15 to win very convincingly. And because he wins the Australian Championship, he's able to represent Australia at the Asian Zonal Tournament, which is going to take place in September 1969. And there he has the chance to play for an IM norm. So that's basically why he did it. He also incidentally represented Australia in the first two chess Olympiads that he played in. And then he um, renounced his Australian citizenship in, I think, 72 uh, or 73. And then he, he represented the U.S. subsequently. But anyway, so he plays in the zonal championship. It was in Singapore. And he ties for first. And because of that, in September 1969, he earns his IM title. This opens a lot of doors to compete in tournaments. In fact, little did he know, but it was going to open a door very quickly because in, um, I think, late September or early October 1969, he's been an IM for a couple weeks now, he gets a call. There's been a, uh, someone who's backed out of a tournament in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and they ask if he can get down there now he he the problem is he has to get he has to catch a flight in two hours after he gets this call so he throws a bunch of stuff in his bag he grabs one book and he jumps on a plane and he barely makes it he says the taxi cab was you know going way over the speed limit and he gets he gets down to san juan puerto rico and he didn't even know who he's going to be playing and tell him over the phone he just shows up and turns out that you had like Bent Larson, Boris Spassky, who's the reigning world championship, or champion, sorry, you have uh, Biscayer who's there. And so he has a very, very strong field. And, you know, he doesn't really have much material with him. Fortunately, Bent Larson loaned him some stuff, and he was very thankful for that. And he ends up scoring 10 out of 15, including getting a draw with Boris Spassky to, to tie for second. And this is October 1969. He qualifies to become a grandmaster. Now, he doesn't actually get the title until 1970 when the FIDE Congress meets and accords him his title. And incidentally, there was only one other person who was awarded a GM title that same year, and he turned out to be pretty darn good. And um, so he went from master to grandmaster in basically two months. He was an IM for like, you know, a couple weeks, essentially. And then hit, uh, then got the GM title. And he was the third per youngest person in the world or history at that point to earn the Grandmaster title after, of course, Bobby Fischer and who was the second youngest? Karpov. Not Karpov. It's a good guess. Spassky. Spassky. Yeah, so he became the third youngest in history. Of course, a lot of people have broken that record, but Brown makes a case for uh, inflation, and we've discussed that in past lectures, and I, I won't get into that polemic again. But anyway, we went over his game in April 1970 when he played in Zagreb. In April 1971, he's so he's invited all over, and he, by the way, he wins the U.S. Open in 71 and 72. That gets him a lot of name recognition, gets him more tournament invitations to play internationally, and he's going all over the world and playing. So in 1971, he's playing a tournament in Argentina in Mar del Plata, and he doesn't play very well. But there he meets a woman named Raquel, uh, Dr. Raquel something or another, he never gives her maiden name, who he later marries, and she's a clinical psychologist with a couple of kids, and meets her in April 1971. They carry on a correspondence uh, over a year long, and then she moves up to live with him uh, in New York at this point in June of 1972, and they end up getting married, I believe, in um, yeah, March of 1973. And they stayed married the remainder of uh, Walter Brown's life, 42 years, a nice, long, fruitful marriage. And he speaks very highly of you know her and, and the help that she was in his, in his chess career and you know, her supportiveness and and all of that. 
So our thoughts obviously go out to her. In August of 1972, he, Brown wins his second U.S. Open, scoring 10.5 out of 12 and beating Bent Larson, among others. This is a strong field. By the way, this is around this is around the same time as the Munich Olympics, where the uh, Israeli part of the Israeli Olympic team was assassinated. And afterward, so to, just to frame that historically for you, and afterward, the tournaments that Brown participated in, some of them had very very high levels of security. So uh, that comes up in the in the early seventies also. So playing style. Everybody remarks on Brown's energy at the board. Now, we've talked about this nervous energy with a couple of different players, notably Gary Kasparov. But I don't know of anybody who maybe moved around or fidgeted in their chair as much as Walter Brown did. Apparently, you know, he would animate the whole room sometimes. He was moving around so much, kind of rocking back and forth. And he was known for this very um, laser-like focus where he would basically put his hands to basically look like work like blinders to focus in on the board and zero in on it and he would take as Warren mentioned sometimes 45 minutes to make a move and there are different ways of figuring out what the best move is sometimes you'll ask a grandmaster well why is that the best move and they'll say it just looks right that wasn't good enough for Walter Brown he had intuition as every player did but he never made the move that his intuition told him to make. He had to calculate it. Now this was a blessing and a curse because it meant that just because he thought a move was good at a glance, he had to calculate all the variations. And there's talk of him, you know, calculating variations and finding some sort of move that his opponent could play, you know, four or five, eight moves later and shaking his head and starting over with a new calculation. And this would get him into time trouble because he might spend way too much time deliberating over a certain move and then find himself scrambling for time later on. And Sirwan actually talks about this and he says, you know, you'd think that all you have to do is just pose problems to him and then he'd spend so much time thinking about it that he'd get in time pressure and then you'd beat him. But um, it turns out that he was one of the best blitz players ever and it was not a, an inconvenience really for him to blitz out 10 moves to reach time control. So he had a reliance on calculation and a very intent focus and a desire to understand all the intricacies before committing himself to making a certain move. So he wins the U.S. Open in 1971 and 1972. He has participated on the Australian team and for the Olympiad twice and given them their best result ever to that point. Then he decides he's going to represent the United States. He had dual citizenship, and I don't know if he had to, um, I don't know if he had to renounce his Australian citizenship or not. He gives that impression in his book. But from then on, he represents the United States, which means he's able to play in the United States Championship. And we know from the moniker, the nickname Mr. Six Time, that he was pretty darn good at that. So he won the U.S. Championship six out of seven straight. Um, times and he may well have won in 1978 also but he withdrew from that one because he didn't like the lighting. Does that remind you of anybody? <laughs> Fisher, right? He didn't like the lighting so he, he withdrew from that tournament. He says unfortunately I w had to withdraw due to poor lighting and so he didn't win in 78 and you'll notice that it wasn't the championship was not held every year like it was during Fisher's time. So Fisher won eight out of the nine times he entered. Brown uh, entered far more than this, obviously, but it could be that if they would have held the tournament in, say, 82 and maybe in 76 also, maybe in 79, that Walter Brown might have tied or even broken Fisher's record and shared with Sammy Ryshevsky, incidentally, of eight U.S. championships. Six is pretty darn good. It places him third all-time behind Fisher and um, Ryshevsky, as we've mentioned. And in terms of who might challenge that record, it's interesting to note that Nakamura won his fourth U.S. championship in 2015. So he's tied with Gatakomsky, and it's conceivable that you know Nakamura could uh, win a couple more and, and maybe exceed or, or surpass Walter Brown, maybe surpass uh, Fisher. We'll see. Only time will tell. It is going to get more difficult with the chair walking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's a fair point. But, but you know, I think Caruana is what, like 23, 24? Nakamura is maybe 26, 27. This, this guy's got a lot of chess left. He is now. He has officially changed his um, association back to the U.S. Chess Federation. So, and we'll talk about that in our Caruana lecture upcoming in a couple months. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, in 1975, Brown is fairly well known. He is kind of seen as the successor to Bobby Fischer. Bobby Fischer greatly improved interest in chess in the United States, and Brown talks about it. You know, he Brown says that Fischer was his hero, and he talks about the fact that membership in the U.S. Chess Federation went from something like 15,000, 20,000 pre-Fischer to like 70 or 80,000 post-Fischer. So Fischer is kind of personally responsible for tripling or quadrupling membership in the U.S. Chess Federation. And then he just drops off the map. You'll remember he refused to, uh, well, he imposed certain conditions for his match against Karpov in 1975, and FIDE didn't ratify all of them, so Fischer refused to play, and therefore his title was vacated, and it was accorded to um, Karpov after he beat Korchnoi. So Brown was kind of the successor to Fischer, and he kind of filled this void left by Fisher. It's kind of like, well, now that fisher has gone, who else do we have? Well, we have Walter Brown. And that may have also played a role in his decision to renounce his, um, well, probably not. I would say he's renounced his Australian citizenship, but, you know, that was 1973, and Fisher didn't really officially kind of fall off the radar until 75, so probably not. So he goes on a tour. He goes on a road trip with his son, um, and... I'll tell you a couple of common themes in Walter Brown when you read his book that come out. One is kind of traveling and speeding to try to get places on time, missing flights, rebooking flights. You know, there's there's a lot of that. There's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, he, he has stuff stolen quite a bit. He, you know, he, he, you know, people steal from his suitcases or steal his suitcases entirely or steal his passport out of his suitcase. It, Unfortunately, that's a common theme. Another common theme is his disdain for police, um, probably because he got pulled over a lot while speeding on road trips like this, or his son did. And finally, whenever you're reading Walter Brown, you can't help but notice his love of food. He almost always talks, when he goes to a tournament, if he ate really good food, he'll talk about it. He'll say, oh, and we had the best fresh seafood there, or you know, the best steak I ever had, or you know, so it, a, 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 a gourmand, certainly, in terms of his... Love of food. So he goes on this tour. He goes to 50 different cities, or he tried to go to 50 different cities. There were two or three that he had. That, that one that fell through, the organizer backed out, and one that he couldn't make because of car problems. But he played a bunch of simuls, and he had 1,328 wins, 40 losses, 49 draws. And he was playing in all sorts of venues. Could have been a chess club, could have been a church, could have been a YMCA, could have been whatever the city had. And he wasn't going to necessarily big cities. He was going wherever people put out an ad in the U.S. Um, uh, through the U.S. Chess Federation. And he just saw who was interested in booking him. And he went and he played a simul and he gave a lecture. And and then he hopped in a car with his, his son and moved on to the next one. And it was a very grueling schedule. Hit 50 different cities in like two months. So six, seven days a week, he was he was working pretty hard and you know spending several hours in the car. But this was, I guess, his attempt to ride that swell of enthusiasm about chess and maybe also keep it keep it going. Now this is actually a picture from a simul that he played in Canada, I think '78. He's shirtless. I, I understand that he didn't. I mean, it wasn't common for him to just. Or sorry. It's, no, he has a shirt. It's just the same color as his skin. Um, it, you know, and so he was. It looks it looks like he had a glance. I was wearing the same thing. Yeah. No, no, he's no. We can see sleeves, right? No, no, no. It's close though. So you know, he would go around. He'd travel, and he would just he'd just play. However many people showed up, it might be fifteen, it might be fifty. You know, he just he didn't know, and he would just play. And but he was also he was very he was known for playing very quickly. It wasn't uncommon for him to go in and face 30, 35 opponents and finish them all off in an hour and a half. For a simul, that's crazy. Anyway, so in 1978, he does another nationwide tour, plays a bunch of simuls again. 
He's playing a lot of tournament chess in this time, and I'll get to that. In April 1979, he has his one and only uh, encounter with Gary Kasparov. They play in Kasparov's first international tournament, and I believe Yugoslavia. And he, young Kasparov, who's just been given this rating of 2200, nobody really knows his playing strength. He's probably closer to 2500 because he was ridiculously good. Beats Walter Brown. Uh, Brown played the Benoni against Kasparov and lost. And the next day, Kasparov, who's, I guess, 13 or 14 maybe at this time, is sitting down going over some variations of the Benoni with um, with Brown. And actually, Tegan Petrosian comes along and, like, shoes Kasparov away and says, no, 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 you know, because there was still this cultural cold war going on and, you know, the the Russians' best hope for the World Chess Championship after Karpov couldn't be, you know, colluding with the American, you know. So that was the only time they played. And incidentally, Brown says that that was the last time that he played the Benoni as black. And afterward, he would play, um, he'd play the white side against the Benoni and do fairly well, but he never played himself. Incidentally, Brown, if you want to know what openings he favored, he very much played what Fisher played. I haven't de delved into that, but Brown was very good at the Nidorf side of the Sicilian, or the Nidorf variation of the Sicilian. Very, very good at the Nidorf. That was kind of his pet uh, line against e4. And then as white, he played e4. So he played a lot of openings that essentially Fisher played, again, following in his footsteps. Okay, so tournaments. There he is up top uh, playing against Korchnoi. Already, you know, not a move's been made, and he's already raising his hands up to his head. And uh, below, you see him analyzing. He's doing a postmortem with Karpov, and uh, Tal is also in the picture. You know, you see a couple of other people hanging around the board. They're analyzing together. So, you know, he was. This was the circle that he was in. He was playing people of the highest caliber. So he won the U.S. Championship. He either won it outright or he tied in 74, 75, 77, 1980, 1981, 1983. He played in 24 U.S. Uh, championships total from 73 to 2007. He also won a bunch of international tournaments. Uh, he, he, uh, Vikings, he won in 1974, tied for first in 1980, won in Reykjavik in 1978, Chile in 1981, Indonesia in 1982. So you could say that the prime of his chess career was essentially probably 71 to maybe 79. There was a little dip there. And then a kind of a resurgence from, say, 80 to 83. Those were really his active kind of peak years. And we'll get into the after that in a moment. But before we do, let's get into games two and three. We're going to do two games this time. These are from both from 1974. The first game... And you have this quote from Walter Brown. He considers to be the best one that he's ever played. And for that, again, Warren will enlighten us. Okay. Yeah, this game is actually pretty pretty awesome. I mean, uh, every every single move he makes is is basically one of the top three engine choices. I mean, which is which is which is pretty sick. I mean, that's that's really hard to do. I mean, uh, you know, if you look at the top player games even today, they they don't always find the top top three choice every move. But so for for that reason, this game is pretty sick. I mean, given the game was kind of short, but still, it's it's, it's pretty hard to be that accurate. So let's take a look. Uh, and given this was played in the pre pre computer era too. Well, there were some computer programs. Oh, okay. I guess I guess that's what I meant. You know, this this was this was uh, before the era where you would actually analyze chess with a computer. I think. What year was this? This was 74. in yeah seventy four. Was in the U.S. Championship. And poor poor. Uh, how, how do you pronounce his name? Bizgeyer. I say Bizgeyer. Bizgeyer. Okay. I've heard it pronounced that way. Before. Yeah, and poor Bizgeyer. He's just he's a pin cushion of pretty much. He's kind of like uh, he was kind of like uh, what what Van Wheely is today. You know, like he's. He's better than most GMs, but like the top players will always just crush him fantastically somehow. <laughs> if you watch this, I'm sorry, Biscayer. You know, it's just uh, 
<laughs> I, I've seen so many great games where people crush Bizbuyer. I've never seen a great game where Bizbuyer actually won. So <laughs> that's why I'm saying this. I've never actually seen him win a chess game, even though I know he's a strong player. Incoming, <laughs> incoming angry YouTube comments. <laughs> but anyway, this is about Walter, okay? So it starts off kind of calm as a uh, Petrov defense, right? Pretty standard theory. And C takes D5. I mean, uh, the modern preference is Bishop E2, keeping the bishop, and it would definitely be my preference. But he decided to go for this line. I mean, the, the advantage of this line is that the position is far more open, so this is definitely the ground life. So this is still theory, and... Um, in this position, it turns out that uh, bishop e6 allows black to pretty much hold the balance. And this is why uh, nowadays it tends to just kind of turn away from this for white. Uh, taking on c7 is not really an issue for black. If you take, black will just play bishop d6, and black will castle, and black has a really healthy position. So even though he's down a pawn, it, that extra pawn isn't particularly useful for white. So black, black has pretty good chances to to get a draw there. So that, that's what black should play. Uh, instead he played c6. Now here is where uh, <laughs> the first thunderbolt comes from. And it's a pretty sick move. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think white should do? Rook e5 is a natural choice, but uh, it's not entirely clear. You know, rook e5, queen z7. Uh, I don't really see a, a great follow-up for white there. Here or after rook e5? Uh, it takes, king takes, um, did you have a follow up in mind? Yeah, this, this seems okay. I mean, queen b4 looks like the best shot, but then c5 defending b7. I think black's doing okay. <clears throat> Uh, 95. I think black would probably play bishop e6 and then castle. Queen e3, uh, bishop, bishop e6. <laughs> yeah, black's position is by no means easy to break. I mean, white probably only has one good move here, <laughs> which is the move that he played. Queen b4 is tempting. Uh, I actually. I looked at this. It turns out queen b7 is okay for black. So what is, what is uh, white white's main trump in this position? What are we trying to take advantage of? The black king is stuck in the center, right? Because if, if black were already castled and it was black's move, black would arguably even be better, right? Bishop, isolated pawn in d4. So if you're white here, you know, this is critical right here. This is where you'd have to think, you know, whether I'm sure Walter thought a lot here. And I think he said he spent like 45 minutes here. I mean, just. Well, we already, we already looked at that. I, I I don't think white has anything special. This is actually instructive in terms of where to spend your time in your own game. I mean, if you're in a position where. The advantage that you have is about to evaporate. You know, you better spend some time there and make sure you keep it. You know, because if White loses the initiative here, you're going to be suffering in a worse position. So White's advantage here is the initiative. So he's got to play really energetically. Bishop G5 is tempting, but then F6. What's that? Well, G4 Bishop takes looks fine. Even bishop e6, you know, blocking the e file. <clears throat> so your advantage is the initiative. So you keep the initiative, you can get all your pieces into play, right? So not all of white's pieces right now are playing, though. Well, before we get to that, so wh which which white piece is pretty much not having any influence on the position? Bishop on c1, maybe, but it does control g5. And rook on a1, it's still... 
not doing anything. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the rook lift in this case looks way too slow. <laughs> so my point is, we didn't get that rook on a1 into the game. Like, for example, if the white bishop were not on c1, white could play rook e5, followed by rook a e1, and black would be under a lot of pressure. But we need time for this, and we need to use our bishop. So how do we buy ourselves time? What's that? You can keep, just get rid of the bishop? That's what he did? <laughs> Sick. <laughs> well, well, we'll see how it works, but uh, I, I mean, honestly, I, I, don't, I don't know how exactly he came up with the move. I guess he was thinking like I just said, but it's by no means obvious. Yeah, it turns out development here is more meaningful than the piece. You just got to get that rook in the game. <laughs> yeah, opening up the G file doesn't really make white seem entirely comfortable, but here it's not really a big problem. So anyway, white, white's point is that if if you take on H6, what will white do here? Rook E5, and then say Queen D7, say. Rook A E1. So bishop's under attack, bishop e6. Now what? e5 was blocked. Yeah, d5. Now if c takes, now what? Exactly. And rook fall. So the bishop is essentially immune because of that sequence. So this diagonal opening up, attacking the rook, is a problem. <laughs> so that that's the first point. The combination is not over. <laughs> so this guy played rook g8. Now rook e5, as mentioned before. Queen back, rook e1, everything's in play. Now bishop e6. Now what? So the e-file is closed. Black is ready to take on h6. Uh, bishop takes g7, I think black would actually castle queenside. Yeah, I mean, bishop g7, if, if you take, you kind of justify white a little bit, because he can now do the similar combination before. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that uh, this guy would have castled queenside. How do we keep the flame alive? You have to justify this. What's that? Very good. Yeah, you white basically has to justify the rooks on the e-file. And if you let the bishop on e6 just sit there, then your previous plays, while spectacular, look kind of pointless. Like, you know, if you play like bishop g5, black's just going to castle queenside, and for all that spectacular play, you have an equal position. <laughs> so knight g5. Got to pry open the e file no matter what. Now here, uh, the point is that although trading pieces is welcome for black, after white takes back, the white king is still going to be stuck in the center. He can't castle because of that bishop, and you're not going to be playing f6 obviously. So this bishop is going to cause a big problem. So he did not take. He instead castled queenside. Now what? Bishop still hanging on h6. What do we do? E5, E5. Does look interesting. What is Black doing? I'm looking at takes and then queen d2. Alright, that's not good. Oh, maybe black can take. Yeah, 
I think a V5, I think black more or less has to take that bishop. And the bishop already does it. This is the same as winning. This fails. Yeah, so I think this sequence is pretty much forced. And now K. Although white does seem better, I don't see anything. I don't see a win. Yeah. No, that, that's probably playable, but I don't see a win for white. Now again, we need to justify the rook on the e file. <laughs> I love that you guys said it at the same time. <laughs> We have brothers in the audience. They basically just blurt it out, and I think that's a yeah. This is crushing because what was defending the bishop on e6 and blocking the e file now goes away. Black essentially has no choice, and white did the win the endgame. Rook e1, another hot computer choice. Pretty much everything all the way. Now white has uh, passes on the king side that are too fast, and he quickly cleans up. So he wins the rook, and then his knight is out. Yeah, an absolutely sick game. I mean, just uh, very precise. You know, um, you know, one one of the things that makes sacrifices like that hard to make a real game is it seemed like Bisgar did nothing wrong. You know, if you, if you play principal chess, it doesn't seem like you can just sacrifice a piece like that. And and what? <laughs> yeah, I think he would probably say bishop h six is the. I think if you asked if you asked him, I think he would say that's the best move of his career. I would say. I mean, it's pretty sick. I mean, it's, it's just a, kind of a bolt from the blue, you know. Yeah, yeah. Th there's a saying in chess that hanging pieces drop off, and although we don't normally think of our rooks in the corners as hanging yeah. pieces, <laughs> it can be worth keeping in mind, you know, because <laughs> a hanging rook on h8 is basically the only thing that justifies white's play. Amazing. So a pretty cool game. Any other questions about this? Yeah, pr pretty neat though. All right, and then we're also going to go over the Quinteros game as well. And so this was another uh, kind of miniature, I would say. So you mentioned Quinteros, you'll recall, was one of the strong resurgence type players. It was also uh, on Fisher's team as a world champion with white. He and Bill Lombardi were on Fisher's team. Yeah, Brown kind of talked about how he uh, he was looking forward to playing Quinteros because uh, Quinteros was a guy who just loved complicated positions, didn't shy away from it, and super you know, aggressive. yeah, super aggressive. Yeah, yeah he, he talked about that earlier how Brown actually regretted not being on his team. But yeah, so Brown was definitely looking forward to this game, and so he actually played provocatively on purpose, apparently. Of course, when he does it, we call it, you know, provocative. When, you know, A players do it, we call it hope chess, right? <laughs> <laughs> so here he played uh, C4, which it, it's it's a main line here, although, you know, castling for white is the more common principal move. Uh, C4 is by no means bad, but it is slightly provocative because uh, black can basically win a pawn here. I mean, it's kind of a silly move, right? You're threatening both e4 and g2. <laughs> um, the, the issue for black, though, is that white is going to gain a lead in development. So white just castles. White is perfectly willing to sacrifice e4 here. c4. More tempty on the queen. Yeah, queen c6 was definitely a terrible move. Uh, if, if queen g4, black is probably doing okay, although... Um, 
you know, although the computer evaluates it, evaluates it basically equal, you know, if I, if I played Houdini, you know, 10 games, I, I'd probably be lost within five leagues every time. So it's a very hard position to handle with black. And if you, if you pit computers against each other, maybe it'll salvage it for black, but it's very hard. So queen c6. Of course, he's not caring about c4. He just wants more development. And Quinteros, again, probably shouldn't have taken this pawn. Because now white, again, just develops another piece. Uh, he, he actually notes in his book, uh, apparently there's a Russian proverb, that uh, one soldier in the field is not an army. <laughs> You know, basically noting the queen being out there by itself. Queen back, bishop at four. So already the white rook is hinting at maybe getting in. Bishop takes b6, is being threatened. Or queen g7. Again, moving the queen. You know, already though, it's kind of hard to offer black advice, so it's, it's kind of hard to criticize. Yeah, you know when you play a game and you look at your score sheet and you see <laughs> Q, 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 <laughs> you, you can probably you know, predict the result. So knight b5, threatening, c6. Yeah, unless it's the end game. It's, it's like the opening. Yeah, in the opening, if you see a bunch of, uh, if you don't see any letters, like it's harder to move. So, meaning you only see pawn moves. <laughs> Yeah, if you see a bunch of those, that's probably not a good sign either. But okay, d6 is being threatened, so e5. Um, it's already a nasty choice for black. I mean, uh, e e6 may look a little bit better, but uh, white has this back on e6. Um, and then if you take, white can actually just take. It gives us a fork on c7. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. I mean, when you look at this with the computer, it's already like plus nine. You know, it's just... It's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. So e5, bishop takes. Of course, we want two open files for the king. Now it's rook b5. Can't take the rook because of the fork on c7. <laughs> <laughs> so queen back. Now knight f5. d6 is being threatened. King f8. Takes. Now knight takes is impossible because of rook d8. So king takes. But now rook e5, and uh, already Quintero's had to resign because queen d6 mate is coming, right? <laughs> yeah. If king f8. Back rank check me. <laughs> yeah, he, he just gave up here. As uh, I think Brown even wrote, he wisely resigned here. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, wow, okay. <laughs> Any questions on this game? All right. Brown said that that game looked like it could have been played in the 19th century because of how, you know, open and tactical it was, and also because uh, it was uncommon to see a player never move either knight or either rook. Okay, I'm going to speed this up a bit so that we can try to um, finish in a reasonable amount of time. 1984, Walter Brown goes through what he calls a semi-retirement. That doesn't mean he stopped playing chess. It just means that chess kind of stopped being his primary occupation and perhaps poker gained more prominence. So he's playing a lot of cash games in you know, California, in the Bay Area, in New York, and the Manhattan area, playing in Vegas, obviously. He's playing with, if any of you follow the World Series of Poker, You've probably seen some of the people that, that he's playing against. He's playing against the Doyle Brunsons and the Johnny Chans and those other people who have won multiple bracelets. Walter never won a bracelet himself, but he did. Uh, he was runner-up once, and I'll get into that. In 1988, his interest in blitz kind of rose to the forefront, and he tried to create, or he did create, a World Blitz Chess Association with the stated goal of 
legitimizing Blitz as a competition. Now he said that you know the big chess federations, the USCF, FIDE, they don't they, have, they don't really have any interest in organizing Blitz events. But what do most people play when they play casually? Well, they play Blitz. You know, so it, he wanted to legitimize it. So he created the World Blitz Chess Association to create some tournaments. He also wrote or, or edited a magazine called Blitz Chess, where he took Blitz games and annotated them and published a magazine bi-monthly and then later quarterly. Unfortunately, uh, he couldn't maintain the uh, effort required to support that, and it folded in 2003. But it did exist. We, we, we in many ways, owe the rise of Blitz and Rapid Chess to Walter Brown, and I also talked to the Kasparov lecture about Kasparov and Short and their television stuff and, and their attempts to legitimize Blitz as well. So we, we owe them a debt. In 2002, Walter Brown was uh, diagnosed with cancer. He underwent chemotherapy. Cancer went into remission and he recovered, but that certainly impacted his, uh, his play. In 2003, incidentally, he was inducted into the World Chess Hall of Fame, which is in St. Louis, right across the street, um, I believe, from the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis. There is an interview with where he's talking with Yasser Sirawan about his um, career. It's on YouTube. It's about an hour and 15 minutes long if you're interested, although much of what uh, he covers in, in his discussion is, is also presented in his book, and I've presented quite a bit of it tonight. In terms of other interests, Walter has always was always super competitive at whatever he did, whether it be Scrabble, whether it be backgammon, whether it be poker. He was also pretty good at pool. He was pretty good at tennis, table tennis. Whatever he, he applied himself at, he essentially wanted to be good at. And he said, and this was an interview that was published in Sports Illustrated in 1976, that he could beat most experts in Scrabble most in backgammon and almost all experts, quote unquote, in poker. So he had a very high opinion of his abilities and it was borne out by his successes. He certainly won more money at poker than he ever did at chess. His official earnings for poker are something like $290,000. But that was only in tournaments where, you know, there was a prize pool and all that. That has, that doesn't even come close to measuring all the money that he won from cash games and you know, and, and unofficial tournaments and, and stakes and side bets and this, that, and the other. So he played in the World Series of Poker many times. He His best finish was in 2007. He was a runner-up in a tournament called Horse, where you play several different forms of poker, I think five different forms of poker. And uh, it was like a $50,000 seat, you know, buy-in for the tournament. But he won his way into it and ended up finishing second. And, you know, the the field included the best players in professional poker and he's known he had known many of them for you know 20 plus years and played against them for 20 plus years he also got his first legitimate job in 1997 so he was born in 1949 he never really had what we would consider a job no flipping burgers no um not even really giving chess classes he did a few here and there but his money was all earned through um, betting, gambling, tournament proceeds, appearance fees for tournaments or simultaneous events, etc. But in 1997, he started working at a, um, at, a, at a card place in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, where he lived. He, lived in Ber he and his wife lived in Berkeley uh, from like the 70s onward. And he worked as what they call a prop player. Essentially, the, the facility paid him to play at different tables with his own money. They gave him an hourly wage to do that. And it was just to drum up interest in that particular game. So they'd send him to this table, and then you know people would flock over there and play. And then if there's another table that was down some people, they'd send him over there, and they just call it out over the PA system. I, I, I don't know poker very well um, because I value holding on to what little money I have. But... Apparently, um, Walter Brown is very, very good at it and, and did it for a number of years and, and made uh, quite a bit at it. And so from 1984 onward, he, his chess kind of fell off as he devoted more and more time to poker. And he, his first love was for chess. Um, you know, it was still his deepest love. 
But as, as many of us have, have noted, and certainly Fisher noted it, but did a lot to change it, it's hard to make a living as a professional chess player. It's a lot easier as a professional poker player. And there are a significant number of chess players who have uh, gone into poker and now are trying to uh, come back to it. I think um, a notable example is Josh Waitzkin. Are you familiar with his story? When they talk of in search of Bobby Fisher, that's the that's the kid they're talking about. Josh Waitzkin, this childhood prodigy who you know uh, rose to chess prominence, but then kind of stopped playing chess altogether and played poker, and now he may be getting back into chess. So, anyway, let's look at games four and five. These were played toward the I don't want to say the end of his career because that's really selling him short. He had a long and distinguished career, but it's. It's played toward the end of his peak, perhaps, would be a better way to put it. And uh, the first one, you, you jo Bovjevic from 1978, and then from Sirwan, um, Yasser Sirwan, and they were rivals for many, many years. But that game was played in 79. And so for those last two, we'll look at them as well. So speaking of poker, I think uh, Alexander Grischuk actually is supposed to be a, a big time poker player. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He may be one of the few that actually both at a high level. Yeah. Yeah, people were – I think it was Fiddler that was saying that if if Grishuk didn't play so much poker, he would have won that candidate cycle back in 2013. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's look at his game with uh, Vibojevic first. Now, Vibojevic is actually uh, still still an active player. Um, he – I. I don't see him playing too many tournaments, but I saw him play like a. There was some tournament where they pitted old stars against the new stars, and he plays with the old stars against Nakamura in a game, and yeah, it was is kind of. Fun. I, I don't know what his nationality is. I definitely don't think he's not. He's not American. Yugoslavian. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've never seen him play in the U.S., but uh, yeah, he's been around for a long time. He's always been pretty strong. So let's check out what Brown does to him. It's not nice. <laughs> so for typical Nimzo India. Now I guess this was a little bit of a surprise for. Uh, by the way, the guy's nickname is Lubo. People just call him Lubo. Uh, it was kind of a surprise for Lubo because uh, normally Brown liked playing Nimzo India himself. I guess is why he normally didn't allow it. So already a little bit of an opening surprise. I will note a little advancement in opening theory. Um, if you recall, we went over a a previous game. Uh, actually, I forget who the, who the players was where where White didn't quite know how to play against the isolated V pawn. I think it might have been a uh, Casablanca game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and notice this time Walter Brown is very well versed in how to play with with V pawn. And playing Bishop G five is a crucial part of White's strategy here to to control that D five square. It's really important. So, you know, Brown uh, is basically well aware of this. And al already black is actually in a critical position. Uh, Queen B3 is a very interesting move. Uh, black has black has some choices here. He could have tried uh, maybe bishop a5 or maybe bishop takes c3. Um, Bishop takes c3 is, is probably his best option. Part of the reason it's tricky for black is because white has this possibility of 95, and that would cause black a lot of problems because then white has ideas of, of perhaps taking on f7 and then taking on h6. So that's kind of problematic. Uh, in the game, he chose queen e7, though. And this was met by a really spectacular move, which yet again is the, the silicon monster's first choice. Well, I have to say d5 does look pretty strong. Uh, yeah, I, I'm actually guessing, um, you know, e5 actually surprisingly doesn't look so bad for black. But I mean, d5 certainly looks good, but it's not quite the best move. Uh, 
bishop e6. takes since black is in the gay can't take on d4 because the rook hangs there I think black is okay there of, of course if, if bishop f6 not not knight takes because of knight d5 but knight d takes seems like black is okay Knight d5. I think if knight d5, black would take and then take on e1. I mean, white's position is pretty good. I mean, you, you could play just like knight e5 here, and white would just have a solid you know, plus e5. But turns out white actually has even stronger. <laughs> well, yeah, that is a that is a tempting idea after the last game, but that's a little bit too slow. Well, it'd be because of the pan position. Yeah, if, if rookie six f takes, yeah, I don't see anything there. In all fairness, you know the move, the move that White played is a move that was probably uh, probably would not exactly think about. Yeah, he played. <laughs> Remember, lightning never strikes twice in the same space, the same spot. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine him telling people that Bishop A6 is my greatest move ever? Wait, which game? <laughs> I will give you a hint. It was another spectacular bishop move. Yeah, we're, it looks like bishop takes e6. doesn't quite work. It's a different bishop sacrifice. Yeah, he played bishop d5. So if you take, then knight takes. Pins everywhere. <laughs> Can't take with a knight because of the pin on the bishop. Can't take with a pawn because of the pin on the on the e file with the rook. Don't, don't be bishop on d4 is a fast white, so yep. black lose the piece. Black is gonna lose material no matter what. Yeah, so you can say why why even bother taking it? Well black has a problem because if you just defend the bishop you run into the same idea. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if you take on c3, then bishop takes c7, and then you take on c8. Right. It's kind of a difficult position for black at that point. <laughs> Yeah, he, he essentially played the only move here, so bishop a6. We can't really protect the bishop, so we have to just move it. But unfortunately, white keeps hunting it. <laughs> bishop doesn't have a lot of great squares. <laughs> now, you could play bishop c4, but yet again, we run into <laughs> knight d5. So black has all sorts of problems here. So he took took the knight on c3, and then played knight d8. Yeah, pretty much, but this is just terribly passive. So bishop back. So now this, as a result of the sequence, the black bishop is very poorly placed on a6, and white's queen is, is ready to enter the fray, as we'll see here. So b5, uh, I mean the problem for black is you can't play bishop d7, because you lose a7. You can't move your knight on b8 because the bishop hangs. So there's not really much choice here, really. c5, keeping an eye on the bishop. 
Now we break up the king's side pawn structure. And how do we continue the attack? Well, c4, I'm not sure how that attacks. Like, why, why, why could you take it? It probably doesn't leave white, white quite enough time. I mean, if white had time to play queen here and bishop c2, he'd be good to go. But after, like, bishop c2, black is going to play queen d5 and block your queen from getting over there. So he wanted to get the... Yeah, I mean, he wanted to get the queen over to the king side, but in order to do that, he has to open up the fourth rank. Queen d5 takes, now queen d4. Now the queen can transfer to the king side, and black's king starts looking really exposed. Yeah, these pieces on the queen side are hardly able to help in any defense. Yeah, I, mean, I think at this point, yeah, we will just already gave up. White just has nasty threats with bishop c2, rook e7 is also a possibility. Can't take because of the fork on f5. You know, white has all kinds of nasty threats that black just can't meet. You know, for example, knight c6 with bishop c2, right? Threading man h7, you know, say, um, yeah, I don't know, say rook h8, then knight f5, and then queen h6, and mate. So black doesn't really have a whole lot of choice in this position. Yeah, pretty cool game. It just shows a classical example of you know a well played you know uh, isolated isolated king pawn position. You know bishop d5 with active pieces. Although I, I will admit bishop d5 is a pretty unique tactic. I've never seen anything like that. I, I don't know how he comes up with these moves. Uh, any questions on this game? All right. Now let's take a look at his, uh, now this is definitely a miniature of uh, Sarawan. Now, it's not very often you see someone of his caliber, because Sarawan was in the top 10 players for, for quite a while. So to miniature him is, is pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> Brown's comments are actually kind of funny. Yeah, it was the black pieces and, uh, you know, winning, winning with black at the high level is a pretty rare occasion. You know, you don't, you don't see a whole lot of 0-1s in high level tournaments. Brown plays opening, you know, pretty pretty ambitiously with g5 here. So already he's just gaining tons of space. Uh, Sarawan was probably a little bit too ambitious himself here. Uh, played f3, trying to break up white black pawns immediately. Uh, yeah, I mean, f f3 is the most, you know, is principal that it gets rid of black center and gives you that square for the knight. But, yeah, I mean, the problem with f3 is... Uh, you really do weaken the dark squares. So, yeah, e3 is just a more solid move here. I mean, it's... Uh, I mean, yeah, 9 f6. I mean, it's, it's pretty much a normal position. White's at a space disadvantage, but it's, it's, it's perfectly playable. Uh, yeah, f3 is just risky, uh, uh, what I would call it. So take, take. Bishop c7. c5. And th this check is, is really annoying. You know, if if bishop b2, then black can play knight d4. And he's going to win that bishop. And there's not really a whole lot of, of squares to move your pieces. I mean, if queen e7, knight d4, and covering c2 is going to be annoying. So Sarawan was a little bit ridiculous. I mean, objectively, he probably should have played bishop b2. But he played king b2. <laughs> Yeah, but Brown notes about this move. He was like, uh, "This move had kind of a nasty intention, which we'll see." He notes that uh, now, now I see why Sir Alwyn, you know, beats uh, all these low-rated players because he plays these tricky moves and they can't think outside of the box. So, well, I, I love thinking outside of the box. <laughs> this is my kind of chess, basically. Uh, so knight d4, bishop d3. So Sir Alwyn's idea is to play rook e1. So King D2 is trying to hold the E file. But Brown said, you know, two can play that game. <laughs> Just slide the king over. 
So now the e-file is not a problem. 9g1, hitting the challenge to the knight on b4. b5. So black's trump here is, is basically the, the danger of the white king again. So he's trying to open up the queen side as quickly as possible. You know, well, white, white could take the pawn, but you know, that'll just help black open up the position with bishop b7, maybe a6. And black has several ways to just continue to open up the position. Um, it says Sarawan chose uh, knight 2, and, and this is okay, but white has to try a little more carefully now. So b takes c, <clears throat> and already, uh, you know, white's already in a tough spot. He, he should take on d4. And then after he takes, takes, um, it's a complicated position, but white white will be fine. You know, the, the problem is black's not going to have a whole lot of pieces to attack white with. So, you know, drumming up uh, the kind of attack that he did is, is not going to be easy. But instead he took on c4, and now after queen b5, he found himself in kind of a difficult spot. Um, move he played in the game, you might think is ridiculous, but if b3, bishop a6, I guess... Sarawan wasn't sure what to do here. Because if you take the bishop, that runs into knight takes c2. And this, this pay on the long diagonal is pretty normal. So in, in the game, Sarawan played uh, queen b3. <laughs> it, it turns out this is not a very good way to defend the bishop, though. <laughs> so what do you think Walter played? Uh, bishop a6, I think white can take it. <clears throat> yeah, that's what he did. Well, oh, sorry, rook d8 first. And now he takes the bishop. Yeah, it's uh, pretty nasty for white because the king doesn't have a lot of squares. Bishop a6, knight b5. Now, if, if king c5, he get mated, right? And here, Sarah one actually just resigned. Uh, I guess he didn't. I guess he didn't want to see the end. I mean, white white really doesn't have a lot of good moves here. I mean, uh, you can play like d6. It runs into knight takes uh, here, and maybe mate, right? Yeah. Yeah, white just doesn't have a lot of options. I mean, uh, you could try a4, but then why don't you guys point out a mate for me? Well, yeah, uh, knight d6, king c5, you know, b5 is guarded. But yeah, uh, knight a3 is quite fun, right? <laughs> Another mate there. Yeah, I forget what the best move for white is. I think uh, white is essentially forced to play, like, uh, I think it was, it was knight c3 or something. But white just uh, gets huge material off of that. Yeah, I guess uh, in the words of Brown, you could say Sarah wanted wisely to come. <laughs> <laughs> any questions about this? I, I would actually be interested to see if, if Sarah one has any comments about this game. <laughs> All right. So in the spirit of a tribute to uh, Mr. Brown, I said that um, we'd have a little time at the end in, in the description on the website that we'd have a little time for um, anecdotes, remembrances. I did, didn't know if anybody in the audience had, had played in Mr. Brown or had you know, spoken with him. He's certainly been um, a very prolific player in American chess and has been all over the country, although he's, he's not been in... Uh, Houston very often, or if at all, to, to my knowledge. So I didn't know if anybody had had the chance to meet him or, or play with him. I read about him and had some uh, Walter stories because he was, you know, he's quite the character. Um, what I find interesting is that he was at a high level in so many different activities. You know, he was playing backgammon with the strongest players in the U.S. who literally, one, one guy in particular who, who literally wrote the book 
on backgammon in the, in the 70s, um, he was playing Scrabble with, again, the best players in the country and holding his own. He was certainly doing very well at chess, certainly doing very well at poker. And there's a story that Walter tells of um, playing Fisher at pool. Uh, I think it was uh, eight ball or nine ball. And um, they only played one game because Walter had the break and essentially ran the table and pocketed all the balls and Fisher didn't even get a chance to play and Fisher didn't want to play him anymore. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just that he was good at one thing. He, you know, people talk about how good he was at, at tennis, you know, how well he could hold his own at tennis. And so I, I think that it's a good example of a person and a player who's applied themselves. Sirwan uses that word applied, and, and Walter Brown says chess is work, work with a capital W. And I think that's the good lesson because oftentimes we talk and I see internet discussions about what separates you know great players from good players, what separates good players from mediocre players. And I've long maintained as both a student of the game and as, as someone who tries to encourage others to play that it's really a question of work and the time you invest into it is determinant of what you get out of it. And Fisher was a good example, Brown is a good example, and we're surrounded by uh, a current crop of young players who are certainly uh, very promising and who work very hard at the game. And so if if there's anything that, that I hope you take away from, from Walter Brown, it's that he worked really hard to get what he, to, to achieve what he did achieve. And he was excellent in so many different fields because he tried really hard and applied himself. And it's not just that he had this nervous energy and this drive, it's that he manifested it through practice. I mean, he was traveling all around the country and around the world, going to tournaments, playing as much as he possibly could. When he was in high school, he was going out every night and playing. And I'm not saying, you know, particularly to our younger students as a teacher, I'd never tell you to, to skip school to go play chess or poker. Um, but that's how he got, that's how he achieved what he achieved. He worked really, really hard at it. And so it's not just a case of an eight genius, even though uh, Danny Kopak says that uh, Walter Brown was one of the smartest people he knew, even though he never finished high school. It's not just a question of intelligence, it's effort. Um, for this, I only used one source. Of course, I only had two weeks to put this together. I, I found some information online as I, as I typically do, but most of my information came from a book written by Walter Brown and published in 2012 uh, called The Stress of Chess and Its Infinite Finesse. As far as chess books go, it's not the best written book I've ever seen. It's quite narrative. You know, I went here in March, I went here in April, I did this in May, and the first round I played so-and-so, and the second round I did played so-and-so, but I like his annotations for his games because each game he introduces with a little context. And I think that's really interesting to know the context of the games that were played. Like, what was on the line when this game was played? What was his thought process as he was going in? And so I appreciate his candidness there. And, and we have not only his uh, annotations from his experience and his memory, but he's also taken the time to go through um, his games with an engine and check them as well, which shows a, a, a good level of diligence. So I um, appreciated this, this work by Mr. Brown, and if you're interested, I would certainly encourage you to take a look at it. To remind you, this was an, kind of an exceptional lecture. It's kind of a one-time thing. We're going to continue on in two weeks, two weeks from today. Is it two weeks from today or three weeks from today? That we have our lecture on uh, Vishwanathan on Anand. Two weeks from today. Okay, so we'll, we'll have our lecture on Vishwanathan Anand, and then we'll continue on with um, Nakamura, who played Walter Brown on a couple of occasions, and Walter Brown made some comments about Nakamura's uh, behavior that he found um, questionable, his morals. Um, but he did note that, that the next time he played him, he was much better. Uh, his behavior is much better. We'll, we'll talk about Karawana, and then we'll get into the other candidates in the upcoming cycle as we go through this process all the way through February. And as always, do you guys have any questions or comments about the material? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, you said that you, you played, you, you had a title in the Jones tournament, which one? 
Yeah, in the Asian Zonal Tournament in Singapore in 1969. That's a good question. So he, for whatever reason, did not do very well in candidate cycles. There are times where he talks about competing at a candidate cycle and finishing like 11th or 12th, tied 11th or 12th. He participated in a couple of different candidate cycles, but he was never close to playing uh, for the world championship. There was talk also about arranging matches. Like there was, I think, Caesars Palace in Nevada um, put together like fifty thousand dollars for for um, for Karpov to fly over and play him, just as a for a match, not for any kind of title or anything like that, but just a match. Like you know, the best player in the world against the, the best American. This was in the mid seventies, but that deal fell through because they couldn't get nationwide television distribution which was one of Caesar's conditions to, uh, to funding the match. So there were, there were a couple of close calls, if you will. There were, um, but he, no, he never, comp he never competed uh, for the world championship, nor was he really that, nor was he ever really on the cusp of playing for the world championship. Um, other questions? Yes. Okay, so the world, the, the World Grand Prix uh, is being, uh, sorry, the, uh, this should actually read the Chess Cup, the World Chess Cup, sorry. Grand Prix is actually already finished, and that was Nakamura and Caruana. Um, the World Chess Cup is in September, and the top two finishers get an automatic seed into the world, into the candidate cycle. So the top two finishers, we, we don't know who they are until late September, but we'll know that they're part of the candidate cycle and, and we'll cover one of them in October and the other in November. By the way, the World Cup is always a little tricky because they have the knockout style. Yeah, I think there are like 120 participants. Yeah, and it's really cool because it's one of the you know, a few times where you'll see the strongest players in the world playing weak at the end. Like, uh, you know, there was a while back, I think it was last year, it was the four one, Sam Shankland played Leko and actually knocked out Peter Leko. Leko mm -hmm. was 27, 30, 40 plus. So Shane won the time and he was able to beat Lego. Yeah. But yeah, it's one of the few times where you'll see some of the best players in the world playing just common folk at the end. And do they play, um, is it just best of one or do they play like best of two? Yeah, it's usually best of two. They play once on each color and then they have tie breaks if needed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's coming up in, in September. 128 players, you can see the list. Participants on Fidia's website. I think you can also see it on Wikipedia's website. There are several American players, uh, particularly younger uh, American players, who are not Nakamura and Caruana. So, if nothing else, it's a good experience. You know, you get to you get to play some high-level competition. I don't remember where that tournament's taking place, but I'm sure that our favorite websites will have extensive coverage over it. And I'm sure that some of our favorite uh, YouTube commentators, like Daniel King, will will have highlights and uh, go over some some uh, interesting games from that tournament. So it'll be something to watch in September. But what I'm really interested in is the candidates tournament in February. 